welcome to session number one. Uh, please grab some pen and paper. Purpose of the symposium is we just want to open your minds, but also give you some really practical uh, theology along the way that you can practice during the week. Okay. Uh, so with your pen and paper, I want you to write down five random words that would describe your life without God. Now, there's no correct way to do this. You could think back maybe about your life before you became a Christian, or you could just imagine your life today. If you were suddenly not in your relationship with God, five random words that describe that life without God. So take a few seconds and write those down. Okay, uh, hopefully you've got your five words. And now look at those five random words, and now ta-da. I want you to now jot down the opposite of each of the five words that you just wrote down, okay? The opposite of each of your words. All right, I'm just trying to peek at a few screens here to see if we're connected here. Okay, that's awesome. All right, well, guess what you just wrote down? That second set of words is what we are going for. I think this is called walking with God, okay? Uh, now, we're going to have some breakout rooms later, but for, I'll just share mine for now. Uh, my five words were empty, lonely, boring, sad, desperate. And then when I wrote down my opposite words, I wrote full, connected, exciting, joyful, and determined. Now, I'm going to just guess that most of us experienced a big contrast between those two opposite sets of words, right? Uh, and this is why uh, we're doing this tonight. We want to make sure that we are building that life, the qualities of life, connected with walking with God, okay? Now, uh, a lot of the ideas that we're going to be hearing about over the next few weeks are from a, one of my favorite books from 2019 by Sky Jethani. The book is called Simply With, and the subtitle is called Reimagining the Way You Relate to God reimagining the way you relate to God. And uh, here's sort of his premise. Um, he talks about these four positions in terms of relationship to God that we should reconsider. And specifically reconsider because each of these positions, although in each of them there is something good, <laughs> there is also some potential problems with each of these different positions with God to God. First one is life under God, okay? This is basically the one we're going to talk about tonight, which is basically, you know, I just have to know what God wants me to do, what he doesn't want me to do, and I follow all those rules, and hopefully everything will be okay. We have life over God, which is, yes, God is good, uh, but I just want the, the principles uh, to make my life better, and uh, as long as those principles work, they're great. Uh, if the principles don't work, then, you know, God and I are going to have a problem. Life from God, uh, this one is probably sometimes called uh, sort of consumerism Christianity, which is uh, I, I only have a relationship with God in order to receive something. Like, as long as I'm getting something and I'm getting good things and everything's going great, life from God is good, but obviously that's going to have some limitations. And then finally, there's life for God which is, um, again, just sort of anything and everything that I got to do uh, you know, to um, make God happy. It, it's just, it's about just following rules and stuff like that. And I'm just trying to live for him. But all of these, as you can see, there is something true about each of them that's okay, but it's not the ultimate goal that Jesus came to give us. And here's what Jesus came to give us. <laughs> Life with God. And we're going to learn a lot about the differences between these different positions as we go over the next few weeks. And why is that important? Well, uh, Jesus started his ministry very early on, right after he got baptized. He came out and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Uh, and what, did he, what was he talking about? He wasn't saying, okay, everybody change the way you're acting. No, repent was a mental assignment. <laughs> I want you all to think about how you think. And don't assume that the way that you think is absolutely always the bullseye and on target. <laughs> 
And this is really why it's important to look at these different positions with God, because if we can't understand how we're off, we can't adjust and get to the bullseye or get to maybe what God ultimately wants all of us to experience, which is life with Him. Okay? Um, and we all know this definition of sin. Sin is when we're off the mark, right? We, God wants us to hit that bullseye, but He also wants us to be aware when we're off, not to feel condemned, but to recognize that so that I can change the way that I think about something and get back to what is righteousness? What is excellent with God? Now, why? where do a lot of these positions come from? Well, there's a lot of hints in Scripture. Here's one big one. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So what this text and several other passages really talk about is that fear and love do not coexist. <laughs> As we are learning to love, we're actually overcoming fear, and hopefully we're becoming, we feel that we're becoming even more and more fearless as we're embracing this radical life of love. And when we look at some of the other positions, we notice that there is sort of an element of fear in all of those other positions. And again, that's where they're a little bit lacking. And that's why we want to get back to that really sweet spot of life with God. Uh, here's a really good outline of fear that I think is just a reality. Uh, I, I use diagrams like this a lot in my, uh, in my counseling work. Uh, but when you look at fear, uh, it has a literal effect on our brains and our thinking. So we have a scary situation or a scary circumstance. You know, you could even call what we're going through right now as a country and as a world, you know, with the pandemic, uh, you know, economic things, political things. There's a lot of situations that are a little, you know, uh, unsettling. And as a result of those things, we can feel out of control. But that's not just a feeling. It's literally a chemical reaction that goes on in our minds and in our brains, activates our nervous system. And unfortunately, one of the first uh, victims uh, when we are in a fear mode is the blood begins to drain from our prefrontal cortex, that, that rational part of our brain right behind our foreheads that's in charge of things like judgment, decision-making, planning, strategizing, and a lot of our spiritual practices actually activate the prefrontal cortex, uses the prefrontal cortex. So again, Neurologically, uh, that scripture that we just looked at really makes sense. Perfect love <laughs> drives out fear. It keeps the fear out <laughs> so that we can have all of our mind and all of our brain uh, working and living with God. And unfortunately, when we lose uh, access to our frontal cortex, we lose the clarity of our thoughts. <laughs> we can't think very straight. And unfortunately, fear, it's not just a momentary thing. Sometimes it can be over many, many weeks and months and this is where we can start acquiring these different positions with God. And we're going to break that down over the next few weeks. So fear, what can it do? It can lead to uh, controlling behavior, uh, especially controlling things around me. <laughs> uh, it can also hijack our belief systems, right? So I have a great set of belief systems, but as soon as fear comes into play, I may lose those belief systems or I start doubting those belief systems. Uh, fear can also be a big distraction from the bigger picture, right? Oftentimes with fear, we have very, very narrow tunnel vision. We only see the threat or the potential threat or the problem. And we don't see the bigger picture, which is, I think, sometimes, uh, you know, the bigger spiritual picture. And then finally, it can distort our purpose. I, I think a lot of people try to live with good purpose but man if there's any fear in that system or we we're getting overcome by fear uh, all of our good purposes can start getting a little messy and distorted now of all these four things i would say the most alarming one is right there hijacking our belief systems and this is why i think 
at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry and John the Baptist, his ministry up until Jesus came was this radical concept of change the way that you think. Because if the way that you think has created a belief system that is rooted in any kind of fear, you're not going to really be able to see the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to really see how amazing and how uh, perfect God is. So this is why this is really, really important. So tonight we're going to talk about life under God. And really the premise of this is our primary role in this position is to determine what God approves or what he disapproves and work vigilantly to remain within those boundaries, okay? So I, I find out what God likes, what he doesn't like, and then I'm very, um, I may be very motivated, I may be very determined, but I'm, I'm constantly sort of doing all these things because there's a little bit of fear of what if. <laughs> if I don't do this, or if I do something wrong, then something bad might happen. Again, this is not a peace-promoting position with God, life under God. The irony of this is we can seek to exert control over God through these strict adherences to rituals and absolute obedience to moral codes. So it's, it's interesting. It, it, you can look at it and go, oh, life under God, it just means you're less than, you're lower, you're weak, or something like that. But sometimes it can also look like you're really just trying to work this system out <laughs> so that you're kind of putting God in his place and making sure he doesn't do something that you're not going to like, or he might do something you know bad to you or something, or that God is punitive or something like that. When yet Romans 2.4 says, God treats us with kindness. He his perfect kindness leads us to that repentance that we need, right? That's not inviting us to a life under him. <laughs> that kindness is leading us to a life with him. Uh, looking at this scripture, this is a really excellent example. This is from Deuteronomy, uh, one of the great commandments. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you. This is a beautiful example of, yes, God does give us commands, but look at the intention of those commands. It's not do this or else. No, God gives us commands because his intention is, I want, I want a good life for you. I want things to go well for you. I, I have good intentions behind these commands. It's not a, an exchange. Well, if you do this, I'll do this for you. And this can lead to uh, a tension <laughs> between morality versus moralism. Now, are Christians moral people? I certainly hope so. <laughs> we, we, I mean, that's part of our makeup. As we are following Jesus and imitating him, from the outside, people are going to look at us and go, gosh, that's a really moral person. And that can be good and admirable and excellent. However, life under God can often start kind of expanding or distorting that life of morality into moralism. And let's look at that definition here for a second. Moralism, it's the practice of moralizing, especially showing a tendency to make judgments about others' morality. Okay, so you can see how this can start to backfire, you know. So I've, I've got my moral life, but now my moral life under God can start to become kind of this weapon against other peoples, right? And again, this is not really what we see, I think, in the steps of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was pretty open hands and like, uh, he, he was here for everybody. He gave his life for everybody, not just the people that might follow him. And a good example of moralism is the older brother in the prodigal son story. Now he, he really was living under the father, right? He followed all the rules, you know, he kept in line, he didn't do those scandalous, rebellious things like his younger brother, and then look at the relationship he has with his dad. It's horrible. He has a horrible relationship with his dad, 
but he followed all the rules. He was moral. He was, you know, trying to do everything that was right, but he missed something. And this is what's really slippery and dangerous about it, this position of life under God. I love this, uh, this quote that we're going to look at. And really what I think this moralism thing is, it's learning as Christians to stay on our side of the moral road. And I love this quote. This is from kind of the recovery world. Not every day is a good day. Live anyway. Not all, you, not all that you love will love you back. Love anyway. Not everyone will tell you the truth, but be honest anyway. And not all deals are fair, but play fair anyway. Again, this is where our, our motive, the reason why we're living this moral life, it's not that I get fairness and everything right in my life. It's got to be connected to God, right? That's got to be my motivation why I do these things. Okay, we're going to have our first breakout room. Uh, and here are two questions. You can talk about both of these or pick one. But the question is, how do we know when we cross the line from morality to moralism? Like, what does that look like? Or another way to ask that question is this one. What's the difference, if any, between being moral with God versus being moral under God? How does morality look differently in those two different positions, okay? So this will be our first breakout room. We're gonna take about, uh, this will be about 10 minutes, actually. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna go back. Uh, let me pull up my slide here. So, life under God, this posture doesn't just affect us individually. It can also create community dynamics. And we just kind of alluded to that in our discussion just now. Uh, when I live life under God, I typically will start um, hanging out with many other people that also live under God. <laughs> and then what ends up happening, if you see this red line, okay, this red line can start to be sort of the, maybe the rules, or the guidelines that determines that you are in and you are under God, okay? Well, this creates an issue because we've been debating that line for a couple thousand years now. And, and over time, what we've noticed happens is if you look at that red line, we've got people that are in, and then we clearly have people that are out, right? You know, we call them those people. And even just saying that kind of makes me a little, uh, sick to my stomach because I, I don't like thinking that way because I don't think Jesus ever went around going, well, golly, what's wrong with those people? Jesus was for everybody, right? He was here for everybody. So look what happens over time with that red line. It gets thicker. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus noticed this problem even in his day that those rules and those, those lines of us and them had gotten so thick and there were so many people out and so few people getting in. In fact, it was hard to get in because there was so much rules. And what goes on with that? Well, it leads to this. And is there any fear going on in this scenario? Well, you bet there is, right? So, and we see this even in one interesting example in John 9. Uh, this kind of reflects the thinking of Jesus's day. Listen to this life under God moment. As he was going along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked, and this is a normal question if you have life under God, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <clears throat> Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. You know, so t calm down, people. <laughs> it's, not this, it's not a sin issue. It's not what this guy did or his parents did. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So you see, this really reflects that life under God thing. So if I don't do all these things correctly, then obviously I will be punished and something bad is going to happen to me. And if something bad happens to me, I can explain it by somewhere I messed up, something I did wrong. And this is exactly the mindset that the disciples had as they approached Jesus. You know, they're looking at this man, he's blind, and yet they immediately associated with, that guy didn't follow the plan, or he didn't follow the rules. And what was it? So let me share you a quick, uh, my, this is my grandma under God moment. 
Uh, this happened to me when I was about nine years old. I was in her living room, just having a great time on a Friday night, which I always did with my grandma at my grandmother's house. I love, love, love my grandma. She was, you know, she represented unconditional love for me as a kid. Now, here's what happened. I, probably that summer, I had seen Star Wars. I didn't just see Star Wars, I saw it like five or six times because I, you know, I, I thought it was amazing, right? So <laughs> I'm talking to my grandmother and I said, hey grandma, you know, you haven't seen this amazing movie. It's called Star Wars. I said, grandma, you know what? Do you go to movies? I don't think you've ever mentioned going to the movies. And here's what my grandmother said. She said, well, David, I, um, I go to church, so I don't go to movies. So, I mean, in, in, in less than 30 seconds, I went from complete joy and enthusiasm, you know, telling my grandmother about Star Wars, and within 30 seconds, I was crying my eyes out because all of a sudden I knew, wait a minute, grandma goes to church, grandma's with God, grandma loves God, uh, you know, she's talking about God all the time, she reads her Bible all the time, I mean, if anybody's with God, I know my grandma's with God and she's a Christian, this is great. But when she said, I go to church, I don't go to movies, I suddenly felt condemned. <laughs> and suddenly, here's this woman that I love and I suddenly felt out. <laughs> I'm not in anymore, I'm suddenly out. Now, I bring this example up because I didn't bring this up to condemn my grandmother. <laughs> I'm, point, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I want us to understand that these different positions that we're looking at, yeah, that's true. we can gravitate into them anytime, okay? And you know what? Later on, my grandmother and I, we had a great conversation about what happened. And we ended up clarifying this whole thing about, you know, you know, really, is it a sin to go to the movies? Well, it probably isn't. And obviously, my parents helped me out with that at the time. And by the way, years later, I ended up taking my grandmother to the movies, so everything was fine. But the point is, just because we find ourselves or someone else in one of these positions with God that may not be ideal, it doesn't mean we judge or condemn. It just means, hey, let's recognize it. And again, let's find a way with God to love those people, to have a discussion with those people and help, right? That's all we wanna do. Um, a list of requirements that religious followers were expected to obey in ancient Israel was referred to as a yoke, okay? So all the rules and laws that had been made up at that time that people had to follow, it was called a yoke, and I think you all know where this is probably going. Um, and Jesus got really upset with this, uh, with this yoke. <laughs> you know, these people, they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So again, what we talked about earlier, that teaching about who's in and who's out and all this moralism had just taken over the entire system. And now it was hard for people to find life with God because all the religious people were teaching life under God. And Jesus had an issue with that. Look what it says in Isaiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. Not repentance and misery, not repentance and work harder, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. When we are in a scary situation or a difficult circumstance, Ask yourselves, what's easier to do, to trust or control? <clears throat> I don't know about you, but my first instinct is usually to control. <laughs> what do I need to do to make sure everything's gonna be okay? But I love what Isaiah says here, in quietness and trust is your strength. And what's interesting is oftentimes when this scripture is quoted, they leave out the last line, which is this, but you would have none of it. So really what I think Isaiah is offering here is he's saying, hey guys, this is what life with God can look like, <laughs> but you would have none of it, you know? And I think this is what, we, what we're trying to get to here is really understanding that 
Life with God is the plan. <laughs> Life with God is what Jesus came to offer us. So let's look at this uh, verse that we uh, that you probably knew I was getting to, but listen to this invitation. This just, I think, so reflects Jesus inviting us to be with God, not under Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think Jesus was absolutely emphasizing life with God not any type of system or regulations where we're just under him and hoping that everything works out. So here's our next discussion. What motivates you to obey God's commands? And what helps you to recognize the difference between the postures under God versus with God? Okay. So again, uh, a lot of these postures are about the motivation. <laughs> Why do I do these things? And, uh, and I think when we uh, have great answers to these kinds of questions, this is where things start becoming a lot more clear for all of us. Our next breakout room, remember you don't have to join the breakout rooms, but if you'd like to, go for it. Otherwise, we'll stay here in the main session and chop it up. All right, guys, we're gonna do one final exercise to wrap up tonight and before, but uh, we're gonna do some Lexio Divina here to close out. And for those of you that maybe have not done this before, uh, we're, I will read the passage, and uh, then we'll have a moment of silence. And in that silence, just really try to recognize any particular words or phrases that really stick out to you in your mind or your heart. And then after that moment of silence, I'll read the text again. And then we'll have another moment of silence. And then in that moment, just really reflecting on what the Holy Spirit is teaching, nudging, or reminding you of uh, from this particular passage. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the same passage that we just read from Matthew 11, but we're going to look at the message translation just to sort of get a different uh, sort of angle on this uh, amazing moment. Uh, what Jesus communicated here. So let's uh, let's start with just taking a couple of slow, deep breaths. Just get really comfortable wherever you're sitting. And try to just connect with any places of relaxation in your body right now. And you can feel free to keep your eyes closed or you can open and read along with me. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. This is the word of God. I'm going to read it again. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. 
I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. This is the word of God. And let's take about two more breaths and then we'll bring the exercise to a close. Okay, uh, we're gonna have our, our final let's chat moment. Um, and just looking at these two things in two or three words, uh, just describe what the experience of doing Lexio Divina was for you tonight. Just the experience. And then the second part, what did the Holy Spirit nudge, teach, or remind you of from this passage? Okay, we'll take, uh, we'll take about six minutes for this group as well. And then we will come back for um, some closing comments and some Q&A and some fellowship. All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope everyone is refreshed from your Lexio Divina time. Uh, before we close out tonight, I just want to give you guys some uh, a little bit of direction for this week. You now have these two ideas in your mind, life under God and life with God. Therefore, this week, you may have a moment where you catch yourself and go, whoa, wait a minute, I'm doing life under God again. So guess what you should do when that happens? Uh, you should beat yourself up. No, just kidding. You don't do that. You don't do that. What you do is you congratulate yourself on recognizing that I'm going down that under God path. <laughs> and as soon as we recognize it, now we have an option. <laughs> and we can go back to uh, the themes, the thoughts, especially from that last passage of Matthew 11, where Jesus is inviting you <laughs> to live with him, to work with him, and, uh, and to watch how he does stuff. So um, anyway, I just want to give you kind of that little bit of a nudge as we go into this new week with this kind of understanding. And uh, before we go into some just open fellowship, I just wanted to make sure if there were any burning questions uh, before we wrap up this session. Oh, sorry, what is the name of the book again? Okay, the name of the book that a lot of this is coming from tonight is the book called With. And the author's name is Sky Japan. Thank you, April, for writing that. And I think April uh, has read this book. So thank you, April, for endorsing. Awesome, awesome. So, um, all right, I don't see any other questions. So guys, uh, oh, Lauren, Lauren Mosley, yes. Yeah, so there were a couple of people who mentioned a podcast and I just caught it really quick. A couple of people mentioned that they listened to this podcast that kind of gives you some history of the Bible. Bema podcast. What is that again? Can you put that in the chat box? Oh, there it is. B E M A. It's well worth your time. <laughs> it is no coincidence that that resource comes up tonight because I think Bema really directs us to a life with God. And I think it is such an eye opening, clarifying way to look at the word. So, uh, yeah, please check out that resource. It's awesome. And uh, hopefully, I hope we can get to see you next week. Awesome. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.